Hi, in this module, I'm going to talk about Bayesian networks and new modeling paradigm. So we have talked about two types of variable-based models. The first was constraint satisfaction problems, where the objective is to find the maximum weight assignment given a factor graph. Then we talked about Markov networks, where we use factor graphs to define a joint probability distribution over assignments, and we were computing marginal probabilities. Now we're going to talk about Bayesian networks, where we still define a distribution over a set of random variables using a factor graph, but now the factors are going to have special meaning. The Bayesian networks were developed by Judea Pearl in the mid-1980s and really have evolved into the more general notion of generative modeling that we see today in machine learning. So quickly, before diving into Bayesian networks, it's helpful to compare and contrast with Markov networks. So both are going to define a probability distribution over assignments to a set of random variables. Um, but the way that each approaches this is very different. So if you're defining a Markov network, you tend to think in terms of specifying a set of preferences. And you throw these factors encoding these preferences into the Markov network. So for example, last time we just threw um, in the transition factor and observation factor for the object tracking example. So the Bayesian network is going to require a more coordinated approach. So in a Bayesian network, the factors are going to be local conditional distributions, as we'll see later. And we really think about a generative process by which each of these variables is set based on other variables in turn. So there are many applications of Bayesian networks, um, or, and more generally, generative models. So I'll just go through a couple of them here. So the first one is topic modeling, where the goal is to discover hidden structure in a large collection of documents. So an example of topic modeling is latent Dirichlet allocation, or LDA. And the LDA posits that each document is generated by drawing a mixture of topics and then generating the words given those topics. Um, another interesting example is this idea of vision as inverse graphics. So much of computer vision today is uh, taking images and processing them in some way to generate semantic descriptions, such as object categories or scene descriptions. So vision as inverse graphics takes a very different approach where we specify using laws of physics, a graphics engine that can generate an image given some semantic description, for example, a 3D model of an object. And then given this model, computer vision is just um, inverse graphics where we're trying to recover the semantic description using uh, the image as input. So this is an example of inference on this uh, generative model. So while this idea hasn't really been able to scale, be scaled past some limited examples, it's, I think, a very tantalizing idea nonetheless. So switching gears a little bit, let's talk about communication networks. So in the communication networks, nodes must send messages, just a sequence of bits, to each other. But these bits can get corrupted along the way due to you know, physics. So the idea behind error correcting codes, um, more in particular, these things called low density parity codes, is that the sender sends a random parity checks on the data bits. And then the receiver obtains a noisy version of both the data and the parity bits. The Bayesian network defines how the original bits are related to the noisy bits. And then the receiver can use Bayesian inference to compute and recover the original bits. So this is actually a very effective idea that's used in practice. The final example is uh, either uh, controversial or a little bit grim, um, which I'll explain later. So this, uh, this is the problem of DNA matching. Um, so there are two use cases of this. One is in forensics. So given DNA found at a crime site, um, even if the suspect's DNA is not in the database, one can still match this DNA against the family members of a subject. And here, the Bayesian network is structured along the family tree and specifies a relationship between the family member's DNA using uh, Mendelian inheritance. 
So now, while this technology has actually been used to solve a number of crime cases, there's definitely a lot of tricky ethical concerns about this expanded DNA matching, especially when an individual's decision to release their own DNA can impact the privacy of family members. So the second use case is in disaster victim identification. So after a big airplane crash or some other disaster, for example, Malaysia Airlines uh, crashed in Ukraine in 2014, a victim's DNA is found at the crash site and is matched against the family members using the same mechanism as I just described to help identify uh, victims. And these methods are very scalable, which allows them to uh, deal with, well, these unfortunate large uh, uh, crash sites. So why Bayesian networks? Well, these days it's kind of hard not to think about problems exclusively through the lens of standard supervised learning, such as just train a deep neural network on a pile of data. Bayesian networks really operate in a very different paradigm, which offers several advantages that I want to underscore here. So the first is that uh, it can handle heterogeneously missing information. So normally when you're doing standard supervised learning, um, your data is fairly homogeneous. You have training input and output pairs, both at training and test time. But in cases where you have missing information or your auxiliary information, Bayesian networks can gracefully handle this missingness in a way that's uh, a little bit more challenging for traditional supervised methods. The second is that Bayesian networks allow you to incorporate prior knowledge much more easily. So when you have it, for example, you understand how Mendelian inheritance works on DNA, or you understand the laws of physics, then Bayesian networks provides a nice language for incorporating this information into your model. And now using this model, you can actually learn from very few samples and extrapolate beyond the training distribution. Whereas in contrast, many kind of model agnostic uh, um, low inductive bias methods such as deep neural networks require much more data to be effective. Um, because you're specifying prior knowledge, you can also interpret the variables inside the Bayesian networks. And this could be useful for understanding why a model is making a certain decision. And you can introspect and ask questions about any of the intermediate variables. And this is just follows from the laws of probability. Finally, Bayesian networks are an important precursor to causal models. So these are beyond the scope of this course, but they are extremely important, especially these days. They allow you to answer questions about interventions. For example, what would happen if we give this drug to this patient? And counterfactuals, what would have happened if we have given this drug? So these questions are extremely tr uh, tricky and deep that standard machine learning or any methods that view the world through just the lens of predictions are really inadequate to answer. So we're not going to talk about this in this course, but I highly encourage you to explore this topic on your own. So finally, Bayesian networks obviously aren't the panacea in many situations. So often in these um, uh, canonical AI applications such as vision, speech, and language, um, we actually have large data sets and we mostly care about prediction and it's extremely hard to incorporate prior knowledge into your models in these very complex domains. So in these cases, Bayesian networks haven't been um, as successful and have largely been supplanted by deep learning approaches, but still having Bayesian networks in your toolkit will allow you to use it effectively when you discover the right problem. So in the remaining modules on Bayesian networks, I will first introduce Bayesian networks more formally. And then I'll talk about probabilistic programming, which is a way to define Bayesian networks using probabilistic programs. So this is a really cool way uh, to think about modeling. Then we'll turn to inference. I'll talk about what inference means, um, computing conditional and marginal probabilities. We're actually going to reduce the problem in Bayesian networks to the uh, the same problem of a big probabilistic inference in Markov networks, allowing to leverage the stuff that we talked about when we talked about uh, Markov networks. Then we're going to specialize to hidden Markov models, HMMs, an important special case of Bayesian networks. We're going to show that the forward-backward algorithm can leverage the chain structure of an HMM 
allowing you to do exact probabilistic inference efficiently. Then we're going to talk about particle filtering, which allows you to do approximate inference and scale up to HMMs where variables have larger domains. Finally, we're going to talk about learning in Bayesian networks. We're just going to start with supervised learning, where all the variables are observed. And this actually turns out to be quite easy. Um, you'll be pleasantly surprised. Then we're going to show you how to guard against overfitting using Laplace smoothing. And finally, we're going to turn to cases where not all the variables are observed, and we introduce the EM algorithm that will help us learn in such Bayesian networks. OK, so let's jump in.